too stand up stand up for Jesus would you stand and we'll sing that first together stand up stand up for Jesus ye soldiers of the cross lift high his royal banner it must not suffer loss from victory unto singing and uh, good to see everybody in church tonight uh, looking forward to a good service together thanks for making the effort and uh, being here this evening let's start with a word of prayer shall we father thank you for tonight thank you for the midweek service and what it means to us and lord we look forward to this in the middle of the week and i pray that you would uh, recharge our batteries uh, spiritually speaking and uh, give us what we need this evening use the songs that we sing together as we sing praise to you uh, bless our fellowship, uh, the prayer time, and our missionary letter, and Lord, uh, the study of your word tonight. May you have your way in each one of our hearts and lives, and Lord, we have many folks have worked today and been a busy schedule in their life today, and they're here now, and I pray you'd help them to, to, to put aside the cares and concerns and so many things that would grab our attention and uh, cause us to lose focus on uh, just giving you our undivided attention for the next hour or so. And I pray you'd help us to do that so we wouldn't miss what you'd want to do in our lives tonight. So speak to us, minister to us, and help us as only you can do. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. While you find your seat, would you turn to number 502, 502, and can it be that I should gain? 502 on that first together. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me?
This week we have a uh, missions letter from a Rock of Ages ministry, Dr. Wendell Rogers. And uh, he starts out by saying, uh, Dear Pastor, Church, and Friends, Prayer Letters from August to September 2016. Uh, Psalm 7911, he uses as a reference verse, Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of his power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. Uh, when you continue to work in the ministry, you have to ask yourself, why the prisoner? Why should the Lord favor their sign? We trust the word of God to reach the men that is in such um, need. It is oftentimes that men who is uh, uh, deferred or defeated in spirit and broken in heart, that the word of God is the most uh, work in his heart. Uh, it is our desire to see these men saved and the word of God to bring them uh, to bring forth fruit in their heart. The Bible stands are uh, stud the Bible studies are so important to them. Uh, we are very uh, happy about the work uh, the, of the Lord at the Rock of Ages Discipleship Ministry uh, continues to see fruit from those who uh, complete lessons and receive Bibles. A certain uh, number of lessons must be completed to receive a Bible. In Ohio alone, there were 2,590 lessons completed and graded with certificates and over 300 Bibles given through August of this year. More Bibles were given to, con uh, to uh, uh, county communities, correction facilities, uh, county justice centers, uh, juvenile justice centers, uh, and we were able to take to those facilities our Bibles with spatial covers. This summer we have traveled about 1,200 miles every two weeks to church and prison ministries. Uh, um, this really adds up over three months. Uh, our 39th annual Rock of Ages conference um, was held the first week of August in Murfreesboro, Tennessee at Franklin Road Baptist Church. Virginia and I both enjoyed God's preaching. Psalm 119, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth, a blessing to our soul. Recently in our travel, we have gone to prisons, missions conferences, missions dinners, speaking at a man's day, and visiting Maslin Baptist College alumni meeting in Pennsylvania. We just returned from helping with Rock of Ages uh, South Carolina, a blitz, and we had a wonderful time. With a total of 10 teams, we covered um, 11 facilities, had a total of 1,569 in attendance, 210 professions of men and women were given the gospel with an opportunity to receive Christ and trust him and he he sa saved glory. We were personally able to visit three full days in the prisons, going cell to cell, door to door, to the dorms, and preaching every day. Our team had a total of 222 in attendance in three days for six uh, different services with 57 salvations. It is in September each year. Mark your calendar for 2017 and come. Go with us. You have a uh, to get your eyes open to this and and let the Lord deal with your heart. Uh, contact me if you want to do that, Brother Rogers at uh, Rock of Ages Ministry. We have men who are being released soon, who have diligently completed many Bible studies uh, lessons. Please pray for them and for us as we are helping th these men. Thank you for helping us. Thank you uh, so very very much. We have a busy October and November scheduled. We need to visit new churches, and we keep up as we keep up our prison schedule. Please continue to pray for us, uh, Brother Rogers and Virginia. Well, they do a great job. They just do a great job. That's a great, great ministry, and appreciate the Rock of Ages uh, prison ministry. All right? Uh, prayer guide. Everybody have one? Anybody need one? Put your hand up, and uh, they'll get it to you right away. Everybody all set? Very good. On the back, of course, we'll look at our coming events, and um, we, we don't have the RU Inside 
uh, tomorrow night. Uh, they've had to postpone that for us. Um, they, they're, they're, they've changed some things in the prison. That's something to, that you ought to pray about. And um, we, we've been having, they, they issued us a badge and, uh, for the last three years or so. And once you have that badge, you're an approved volunteer. You just go in, sign the thing, go through the metal detectors, and then we just would go to the chapel and have the service set up and ready to go. Now they've changed that and got rid of the badges again, and now they have to bring your driver's license in, and they just put that in a little pouch, but now they don't let you walk yourself back anymore. A chaplain has to be there to come up and get you and walk you down there. Uh, the ones he mentioned going cell to cell, they can't do that anymore here. Even the ones who are holding Bible studies in the cells, they have to have the men come from their cells and come to the chapel now. Uh, not sure what happened or what brought about that change but uh we're going to try to find out what's uh what's happening with that so consequently this thursday neither chaplain is there one of them is on vacation the other one is not going to be working late and so there's no one there to walk us back and so they canceled the the meeting so uh appreciate you praying about that situation and let's see if god can change that back the way it was amen so uh, be praying for our Are You Here Friday night, 7 p.m. Uh, that'll be as usual and out at London on Saturday morning, 8.30. And then, of course, our soul winning and bus visitation at 10 a.m. on Saturday right here. Then Sunday will be Old Fashioned Sunday, okay? And uh, that'll be a great time. I'm looking forward to that. Always a fun day together. And uh, dinner afterwards, dinner on the grounds. If you haven't signed up for that downstairs, please get your name on that list. We kind of know what to expect for Sunday. Uh, and then the rest of the things coming up uh, here in the rest of the month in the first part of November. All right. And uh, we did have a great night at CRC last Thursday. We had 26 total in attendance, 22 men, 14 of them were new. And uh, 10 were saved on Thursday night and a good response to the gospel. And they had 12 out at London on Saturday, all of those returning men uh, on Saturday morning. Continue to pray for these on our uh, health list and uh, for those who are struggling uh, with their physical well-being. Continue to lift them up in prayer if you would. And, of course, we're praying for those in authority in our country. And I hope you're praying for the election that will be coming up. Uh, here in a few weeks that uh, the Lord will have his way in that uh, then of course we pray for our military and those defending our country and these who are battling cancer uh, we pray for them and then these on our salvation list that the Lord will uh, see fit to save their soul put someone in their life who they'll listen to they'll have influence and they'll be able to trust Christ as their savior and uh, the unreached people groups of the world and uh, praying for God to reach out to them and uh, that we'll see laborers go to these people and try to reach them with the gospel. And then, of course, our missionaries highlighted by uh, Brother Rogers tonight in the Rock of Ages uh, prison ministry. All right. And uh, also, just a reminder, ladies, for your retreat, uh, going to the retreat in Canal Winchester, just a reminder, the bus, if you're going to ride the bus down Friday night, it leaves here at 530. And if you're going to ride again Saturday morning, 730 Saturday morning. Okay, so just a reminder, those of you who are going to go together on the, the white bus. All right. Well, let's prepare to go to prayer. Brother Paul Label, would you come tonight and lead us in our prayer this evening, please? And uh, let's unite our hearts together in prayer. As the Brother John leads us audibly, pray along with him silently. That's how you kind of stay focused and don't let your mind wander away. But pray together with him as he leads us tonight. Brother John. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the word of God that is preached here at this church, and we pray that you bless it and bless the man that's uh, giving the message. And we ask that each one of us will be here as the word swears, also as well as the doers. And we thank you for our, our missionaries that uh, we have uh, partial support of, and we thank you for their they're uh, giving the time of their life to go down there to where they're going and we ask that you would be, help them then help them with the the many things that they come in contact with and keep the evil one from them and we ask that you would uh, give them the, the the wisdom and the knowledge that they need as they preach uh, the word of god in each country and, and across the united states and we pray for our our ru group that you would continue to help those men that are in prison and make a profession of faith we pray that you could help them 
uh, build a hedge about them as they grow and get spiritually fed here at the church or at the prison. We ask that you'd also be with uh, the many uh, many uh, areas of the church here that we can go out and visit and uh, get involved in. And we pray that each one would be seek, seeking their hearts and wanting to find out what to, just exactly what you want us to do. And then we do pray for those men that have are in the military. And we just pray that you'd help those and keep the evil one from them. And because many times it's in this military, it's a, a wicked and ungodly situation. We pray that you'd help those men that are there, that they're saved, that you'd help them and continue to stay faithful to thee. And we ask that you'd continue to be with the men that we uh, voted in office in this upcoming less, uh, time when we vote. We pray that you, we know what you want, and so we ask that you just continue to work in that and deal in that. And then we thank you for this, uh, the missionaries that are Rock of Ages and the prison ministry that they're, <coughs> that they're involved in. We thank you for that. Thank you for the way that the souls are getting saved there also. We do want to pray for the church here, and thank you for the song leading, the singing, and the things that get us ready for the message, and we just ask that you would uh, help us and uh, be each one of us would be listeners and hearers of the word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Two hundred and forty-three, two, four, three. Would you stand with me as we sing? I am resolved no longer to linger. Two, four, three. On that first together. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come third i am resolved to follow the savior faithful and true each day heed what he saith do what he willeth he is the living way i will hasten to him hasten so glad and free jesus greatest highest I will come to thee. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom. As you find your seats, let's sing that last together. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. All right, good singing. You can be seated. Ushers will come and get our offering now this evening. And, uh, also, I, wanna, I was supposed to remind ladies that would like a hat for Old Fashioned Sunday. There's a table in the Fellowship Hall that has hats on it, okay? That's for you to use and then return Sunday night when you're done, okay? So there'll be hats for next year when Old Fashioned Sunday rolls around. So if you'd like to take a look at that, ladies, on your way out, uh, see if there's something there that suits your fancy, and uh, go for it, all right? All right, let's pray for our offering now this evening. Brother Abrams, have you lead some prayer? Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord, uh, for another day, another day to serve you. And, uh, Lord, uh, uh, it was a beautiful one. And uh, we thank you for that. And uh, we ask you to bless this offering now and uh, multiply it as you would. Bless each gift and each giver. Lord, uh, uh, bless the pastor as he brings the message. And, uh, Lord, uh, uh, just uh, have a good fellowship, a good feeling about our church family. And uh, let us... Uh, uh, come to your presence uh, uh, boldly, Lord, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, take your Bible tonight, if you would, please, and go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, let's uh, begin reading as we usually do. I'll read at verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 
Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And the word wrestle there literally means hand-to-hand combat. Okay? Hand-to-hand combat against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Father, add your blessing to our scripture reading here this evening. And Lord, I pray that you would open our understanding as we look at this, uh, begin to look at this armor of God that you provided for us to put on in our hand-to-hand combat with the enemy. Lord, remind us that it's not flesh and blood that we wrestle against. Uh, Lord, it is against spiritual wickedness. It's against the devil, our enemy. Lord, I pray that you would give us uh, the understanding, the insight, and Lord, the understanding that we have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless our study here this evening, Lord. May it be helpful to the people of God. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Spiritual warfare. And in the spiritual warfare, we're reading now, and we're going to be studying over the next several weeks, the armor that God gives us in this spiritual warfare. You know, God is a God of order. God does everything decently and in order. I think the... Uh, that's why there's such order in the universe and there's order among the planets and order in, in what God does. He does it orderly. Uh, where the Bible says when there's, uh, by the way, when God's not present, there's confusion, uh, there's strife, there's uh, everything is chaotic, all right? That's an indication that God's not in it, all right? So uh, I believe the order that God gives us the pieces of armor are important. And it's, uh, I think it's important that he begins when he tells us to put on the armor. The very first piece we put on, he said, is to have our loins girt about with truth. With truth. We talked about this when we discussed the devil, our enemy. We discussed the fact that he likes to hit below the belt. And that is, uh, whether it's boxing, football, any sport, when that happens, that's a penalty, and sometimes it's uh, expulsion from the game. It's just not permitted. It's not allowed. But Satan doesn't care. He's ruthless. He's cruel. He is destructive. The Bible says that Satan comes to, to um, uh, kill, steal, and destroy. And he will, he will do that to every single person that he has to do with. Um, he, makes, he, always, he always makes things look attractive. He always makes them look so good, pleasant, fun, but they end up making you miserable and troubled. Nobody, listen, the Bible says the way of transgressors is hard. It's a hard way to go. It's a hard way to go through life. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6 about the well, a woman that lives in pleasure, it says, you know what? She's dead while she lives. People who just live for pleasure, you think they're having a great time. No, the Bible says they're dead while they live. There's no, there's no pleasure there. Satan will destroy you if he possibly can. That's what he's out to do. You know, I was going to look. Where's that songbook? Bob must have taken it with him. Let me find a songbook here. Is a... I meant to look ahead of time on this. Is a mighty fortress is our God. Is that in here? A mighty fortress is our God. How many of you know that song? It is. 547 in your book. 547. Just take, Jake, take a second. Just look at this, would you? I'm glad we have a the book, and I'm glad we have a hymn book. Amen.
Notice verse 1. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Now watch. For still our ancient foe. Who's that? That's Satan. Does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Boy, there's powerful words. And true words. And so the most often, listen, there's there's no we, we understand he's he is powerful. He is not, as we learned from before, he is not all powerful. Only one is all powerful, and that's God. But he is definitely, he's going to be more powerful than you on your own or me on my own. Don't think, ah, I'm tough, I can handle Satan. Uh, he'll, he'll chew you up and spit you out. I don't care who you are, how tough you think you are. Now, the most oft used of Satan's devices is the lie. Lying. Revelation 20, verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice the devil that deceived them. That's his main operation. He lies to people. He always wants to deceive man. Now, take your Bible and look at John chapter 8 with me, will you? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Look at John chapter 8. John 8. And here Jesus is speaking to some Pharisees who do not want to believe what He's saying. And He says in verse 43, Why do you not understand My speech? John 8, 43, Even because you cannot hear My word. So here's what Jesus says, Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So he lies. So whenever you're being attacked by Satan, whenever you're under the pressure from Satan or one of his demons, you can be absolutely certain a lie is involved. A lie is involved. We've been deceived or we believed His lies. And the more you believe His lies, the more ground He gains in your life. The more control He gets to have. That's why there's no more important piece of armor to put on than truth. Truth. Your loins gird about with truth. It's, it's sometimes called the belt of truth, it, but it goes from your midsection. It's, it's from your innermost being. In other words, uh, the, in fact, I believe there's a verse in the Old Testament that says, David says, I think thou desirest truth in the inward parts. I mean, uh, it's not just, um, well, I'm just, all right, I guess I'll tell you the truth. No, no, no. It's, it's what you do. It's, it's who you are. It's part of you. It's down from deep inside. And so I, I want what, what we need to do is we need to pray daily and ask God to reveal to us any areas where Satan is deceiving us. Because we, we are not smart enough to know it by ourselves. He's too good. And he'll deceive us. So we have to make sure we're asking God to show us. Now, look at Ephesians chapter 4, would you please? But so therefore, listen, it's very important that we always desire to speak and live the truth. That's why in Ephesians chapter 4, where it talks about putting off the old man and then putting on the new man in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about in verse 24, you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away, what? Lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. One thing you do once you're saved is now, I put away the lying. Why? That was my old father. 
When I got saved, I got a new father. And now he is truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now I speak truth with my neighbor. I'm going to be truthful and I'm going to be honest. Though most of us don't want to admit it, lying is quite common even among Christians. And that's sad. I mean, misleading statements, deliberate attempts to maybe leave a false impression, half-truths, or what we call, well, just a little white lie. There's no such thing, by the way. Years ago, I had a, I had a not at this church, but had a youth pastor who was raising money uh, trying to raise a special offering, and I don't even know what, I don't remember what it was for now. But I remember talking to him on a Monday, and he had a jar there where the teens had put the offering in, and I said, well, there, there's a check in there. And I reached in there and pulled the check out, and guess what? It was just blank. I said, who would put just a blank check in there? He goes, oh, I did that just to kind of prime the pump. Told him, oh, here's my check. I'm putting my check in. Well, you know what? That's lying. That's deception. See? And that had to be confronted. That had to be checked. That's, that's giving a false impression. Hey, Ananias and Sapphira thought they'd give a false impression. How'd that work out? Yeah, God struck them dead for it. Uh, God takes this matter seriously. You know why? Because lying makes us like Satan. It is the exact opposite of God. Okay? So, we, anytime we tell a lie, we're allowing Satan to gain a foothold in our life. My, my, my dad, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard growing up, tell me the truth. It'll be so much better for you if you tell me the truth. He says, I cannot deal with a liar. And I never forgot that. And I, I remember, I might have told you at a time that, you know, he had told, we, we were supposed to go to an Indians baseball game. We were excited, and my brother and I both played baseball, and we started throwing the baseball around in the front yard, which he said we're never to do. We, we were to play in the backyard. And, and, and he let us, I mean, we had bare spots in the backyard from the baseball games we would play back there and and that was okay he let us do that and we had a loom, the old aluminum siding on the house and we wiffle ball but we didn't just have wiffle balls we taped the wiffle balls with either electrical tape or duct tape they were heavier and then we had the harder bat and uh, we would play games out there hours on end and we peppered that side of the garage and little that side, and they were dense all over the place and but we threw the ball out in the front yard and and in the course of throwing the ball, I won't say it was a bad throw. I think it was, but I didn't catch the ball, and it went past me and right through the window in the front of our house. Dad's coming home. We're supposed to go to the ball game. What do you do? I just just cover it up. I did. I closed the drapes. I'm going to tell you what happened. I, uh, he came in the house. I said, Dad, i got to tell you something. And I'm, I think I'm maybe 11 years old, 10 years old, 11 years old. And I took him over to the window and I opened the drapes. And there was, of course, it was about the size of a baseball right through the pane of glass. And I said, we played out in the front yard and I broke the window and I wanted to tell you. Of course, you understand with a brother and three sisters, if I didn't tell them, somebody was going to. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you say amen to that. You had brothers and sisters at home. And, and you know what was great? He said, I appreciate you telling me and that I didn't have to find out some other way. And he said, you disobeyed. You shouldn't have played in the front yard. He says, and you'll pay for the window. And I had to work and earn money to pay for that window to get repaired. But we went to the ball game, and I didn't get whipped for it or anything. And, uh, and I learned a valuable lesson. It is better to tell the truth and to just come clean. And so uh, that, I never forgot that lesson. Now, let's, let's look at four sources of truth. 
Can we do that? Four sources of truth. As we gird up our loins with truth. We put on that belt of truth as it were. Uh, the first source of truth is the Son of God. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, we know, is the truth. I want you to look at the Gospel of John. Would you go there, please? Most of us know John 14, 6. Look at John chapter 1. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we know that Jesus is the truth. But notice John 1 and verse number 14. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's full of truth? Jesus Christ. He's the embodiment of truth. He is our protection from a takeover from Satan. When, you, when, when the Bible says in Romans 13, 14, it says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. When I put on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm putting on the truth. I'm, I'm protecting myself from Satan. In fact, you'll find as we go through this, and at, at some point in the study, we'll wrap it all together, you'll find that every piece of armor is related to Jesus Christ. And so when he says in Romans 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it is no different than putting on the whole armor of God. We're to be clothed in Him. Now, I want you to know, nobody will put the truth on for you. Nobody puts the armor on for you. Sometimes we, we, we have to work with people in our you, and truth is, just Christians in general. And what they want to do is, I don't want to put the armor on, I don't want to put forth any effort, but they come and say, pray for me. Well, why am I praying for you when you're not want to be a doer of the Word and you, don't want to, you just want to be a hearer? What am I praying for? I'm going to pray you'll be a doer. I'm going to pray that you'll do what's right in God's sight. Otherwise, the, the prayers are wasted prayers. A prayer never overcomes somebody's disobedience. Okay? You have to be obedient. And so, nobody puts on the belt of truth for you. You must actively put it on for yourself. You can't be passive and hope someone else will do it for you. Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but... Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's a, that's a reality that has to be acknowledged by us every single day. Every day that I'm crucified with Christ, but He lives through me. And every day I'm going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means I will put on the truth. And by the way, that's truth at church. That's truth at home. That's truth where you work. Sometimes people get the idea, well, this business is business, you know. Uh, business still ought to be truthful. You be truthful in your dealings. Truthful at all times. And so it's important to know the truth is the Son of God. The second source of truth is the Word of God. The first is the Son of God. The second is the Word of God. Notice with me 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Most of you are familiar with this verse. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the what? Word of truth. What do you have in your hand tonight? The Word of Truth. You have the Word of Truth. The Bible is our authority. The Bible says here in James 1 and verse 18, Of His own will begat He us with the Word of Truth. James 1, 18. So it's the Word of Truth. What does it mean? It means the Bible is God's truth to us. It is our final authority for our life. Do I accept the Bible as authoritative? Or do I find myself saying, well, I know what the Bible says, but... 
Well, well, yeah, I know, I know what the pastor said that that, that passage meant, but and then we go somewhere else. Is it, is it not just an authority? Is it my final authority? Does it have the final say? By the way, it's not experience. I'll say more about that in a minute. But listen, do I accept that successful spiritual warfare begins with this important question. Do I accept God's Word as divine revelation and is it my absolute final authority that I live my life by? Is it my only standard of truth? I exercise faith that as I read, study, memorize, and meditate in God's Word, that God will give me His revelation and, and I'll receive what God wants me to know. We can never, listen, we can never trust the wisdom of man to find the truth of God. Look at, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's see what Paul said to the church here at Corinth, who evidently was putting a lot of stock in the wisdom of man, in the wisdom of the world. Verse 21, notice what he writes. For after that, in, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The world by wisdom knew not God. They'll never get to know God through their wisdom. You can't trust the wisdom of man to find the truth of God. You say, I believe that's divine revelation. And by the way, that's by faith. I believe it by faith. The Bible talks about over in the book of Hebrews that the word uh, preached didn't profit somebody because they didn't mix it with faith in them that hear it, heard it. You, you have to have faith to believe that's God's word. And that is, I wasn't there. I believe what the Bible says about it. Someone was talking to me last week and said they talked to somebody and they said, oh, the Bible's just written by man. Well, it was penned by men, but the author was divine. They penned what God told them to write. Why do you believe that? Because the Bible says that's what happened. And I believe that by faith. By faith. And, and, and that's the standard we live by. This is the truth we use, and we'll say more about it when we talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But this is the truth we use to fight off the lies and deceptions of Satan. This is what this is what 2 Corinthians is talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 when it says that we're cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It means we we cast out any imaginations, any thoughts that come to us that go against what that book tells us to be true about God. I don't know how many times in the last few weeks people have talked to me and they've made statements and I said, you know what? That's a lie. That's not true. And they look a little taken back, but they believe the lie of the devil. They believe in something that the Bible says is wrong and, and isn't true. And so you have to just confront the lie with the truth. And, and you, you bring every thought into obedience to what the Word of God says. Thy Word is truth, Jesus said. Only one book in all the world is truth. And you're holding it in your hand tonight. It's God's Word. That's the truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. Okay? Two sources of truth so far. The Son of God. Number two, the Word of God. Number three is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Again, the verses in John, when Jesus is speaking of the Comforter coming, the Spirit coming, He says in John 14 and verse number 17, He calls Him the Spirit of truth. 
which the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Over in chapter 15 and verse 26 again, he says, When the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even, notice, the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Over in chapter 16 and verse 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine, and will show it unto you. Now I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So, He's the Spirit of truth. God's Word is truth. So who is going to open up the Bible for us to understand God's truth if it's not the Spirit of truth? So we find the Holy Spirit of God is the one who opens up our understanding to the Word of God. Okay, Here's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 teaches us. Notice verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God hath ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of the world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither is entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Ah, but God hath revealed them unto us. How, church? By His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's how we know what's given to us by God. Because the Spirit of God's in us. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, not the wisdom of man, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the unsaved man, he doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Spiritually disabled. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit of God. They don't have the Spirit of truth to reveal to them the Word of truth. There's never an excuse for a Christian to say, I just can't understand the Bible. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of you. Ask Him to teach you the Bible. Ask Him to open your understanding. Never open the Bible without talking to Him first. And say, I need your help. I don't want to look at this through my natural mind. And that's, that's where false doctrine comes in. When people get the Scripture and they're looking at it through their own mind instead of the Spirit and being guided by the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, listen, the Holy Spirit will never lead you to believe, act, or have an attitude that is contrary to the written Word of God the Bible, or the living Word of God, Jesus Christ. Did you get that? I can't stress that enough. The Spirit of God will never lead you to believe or act or have an attitude that is contrary to the written Word or to the living Word. Today, people say they've received extra-biblical revelations. They want to stand up and say, the Spirit has given me a message for Brett, Brett down here. And Brett, the Spirit has said, you know, if, the, if, the, if the Spirit of God gives Brett Linke a message, it'll be through the Word of God. There's no extra, more, there's no extra revelation going on. God, God did it when He gave us the Word of God. And three different times, don't, don't take away from it, don't add to it, these are my words. And so, uh, don't, People hear that and they accept it as truth. 
And it's error. It's error. There was a woman preaching that said the Holy Spirit had told her to divorce her husband so she could give herself to full-time preaching. Serving the Lord in her meetings. Well, I have no doubt a spirit told her to do that, but I'll guarantee it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was not. Why? Because that's contrary to the teaching of the Bible. The Spirit of God is not going to tell you something that goes against the Word of God. Or goes against the Son of God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Would you please? 2 Peter chapter 1. Sure glad I have a Bible, aren't you? 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to, I want to reiterate something here. I've said this before, but let's, let's make sure we understand. Verse 16. Peter writes here, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a one or such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When did Peter hear that? Huh? No. In the Mount of Transfiguration. And that's what he tells us in the next verse. Notice what he said. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the holy mount. That's when they saw Him in His glory. He was transfigured before their face and He was white and glistering, the Bible says. And they saw His glory. And Moses and Elijah appeared, remember? And then Peter wanted to build three tabernacles, remember? And then the Moses and Elijah disappeared and God said, This is my beloved Son, hear Him. It's about Jesus. Now, so he heard, let me ask you a question. He heard the audible voice of God. Yes? Yes, he did. What's he say in verse number 19? We have also a more sure word of prophecy. More sure than what? More sure than the audible voice of God. If I give you a word or I give you a written word, which would you rather have? What's more sure? The written word. God made it sure. He gave it to us in writing. You have no way to verify a spoken word. There's people in, I'm sure there are people in court in Columbus today that say, he said, no, he said, no, he said, no, he said, and it's just their word against each other's word because nobody wrote anything down. And when, when or you have somebody like a Joseph Smith saying the angel Moroni appeared to me and told me that Christianity's all messed up and uh, he's going to bring it back to the Mormon church. Well, how are you going to refute that? He said it, he appeared to him. How are you going to refute when uh, back in the day when Oral Roberts said Jesus appeared to him and, and this, was, this wasn't just Jesus. If I remember correctly, it was 900 foot Jesus. And he said, I'm build this big prayer tower. Remember that? And he told me to build that. But he didn't. what he didn't say was, he told me to build it, but he, I'm making all you pay for it. He left that part out, but that's what he told everybody. You can't refute those things, but listen, you know what? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Where until you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, here you go. No prophecy of the Scripture is any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Men didn't just write what they wanted to. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. There's no prophecy of Scripture that is of any private interpretation. You can't just make the Bible mean what you want it to mean. You can't just make it your private. Well, this is what this is teaching. You have to, you have to, there's a context that it goes in. There's a, you know, the fellow who was discouraged and despondent and just thought he'd open his Bible. He didn't know where to read, so he just closed his eyes and opened it. And the verse he opened to said, Judas went out and hanged himself. He thought, I don't want to, that sounds bad. So he, he opened up again and, and he said, go thou and do likewise. Uh-oh. So he closed the Bible and he, 
Tried a third time and opened it up and said, What thou doest, do quickly. Amen. Well, you start in privately interpreting the Bible, you're in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. If you think the Spirit of God is leading you to do something that's contrary to the Word of God, you are being deceived. You are believing a lie. Don't do it. Don't go there. So I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth, to help me not be led to be led astray by by uh, uh, error or by by the way or by experiences. I've had people of the charismatic persuasion say, "I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I've experienced." I, I got news for you. If my experience is one thing and the Bible says another, the Bible's right, my experience is wrong. It's just that simple. I let God be true and every man a liar. I have to submit my experiences to the Word of God. And all of us have to do that. And so I don't want to be led astray by error or experiences or movements that are not consistent with His truth. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me do that. And He will do it. That's why He's there. He will guide you into all truth. Okay? And He will let you know when there's error. All right, we have three sources so far. We have, number one, the Son of God. Number two, the Word of God. Number three, the Spirit of God. Number four, and this may surprise you, the Church of God. The church of God. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, please. Notice verse number 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The local church is raised to a very high level of importance in the work of God. It's called God's household. It's called the church of the living God. I believe every Christian ought to belong and be active in a local New Testament Bible-believing Baptist church. I believe that. The Christian is to submit himself to the disciplines of the church, the, the checks and balances of the church. Believers are here to encourage one another in the Lord and exhort one another, the Bible says, when we, for, when we assemble together. And then we're, we're, when we're under the protection of the local church and we're banded together with other believers in the local church, the enemy will flee. The enemy will flee. There's strength there. Whenever the shepherd would have the sheep, the wolves and the bears and the, the, the predators, they would prey on the sheep that wandered away from the flock. The ones that would think that they could be okay out by themselves. You need the church. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. So you cannot be right with God and wrong with the church. You can't be right with God and wrong with the church. You're, can I help you? I believe your stability, your strength, your power largely will come from the local church. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. We try to tell folks on Friday night, are you not enough? If all you do is come Friday night, are you? You're not going to succeed. And if you're going to know the success. And by the way, you can journal. And you can do the curriculum. But it is set up that you must have the local church. Don't, don't try to have success without the church. How many of you through your life, you've been, how many have been saved maybe longer than five years or longer than ten years? In just a minute. And you had some time in your Christian life when you weren't in church. You were still saved because you accepted Christ as Savior, but you weren't in church. 
How many how many went through a time like that in your life? Look at that. Okay. How'd you do? Boy, that's a time you look back and say, Boy, I really was serving God then, wasn't I? Boy, Satan really stayed away from me during those days, didn't he? Boy, I was stable, I was steadfast, I was unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. No, most of you look back on those days and you wish you could have them back. Say, I wish I hadn't have fallen away. I wish I'd have stayed in the house of God. The word pillar means a column. As you know, pillar that, that like support a building. So it, it's anything firm that props or supports. And so it says here, the church is a pillar. It, it supports the truth. And the truth is what upholds us. And so it, it helps prop us up. It helps uh, uh, to, to support us. It sustains the building amidst the elements or are, are a natural tendency to fall or the assaults that are made upon it. It preserves it when otherwise the building would tumble into ruin. That's what the church can do for you as the church upholds the truth. That's why when you come to church, you don't just come to church to fellowship, though that's part of it. You don't just come to church to see everybody, though that's okay. But it's, it, listen, it's a waste of time if the truth isn't here. You know what you, know what you do on Wednesday night? You come and the, pillar get, the pillars get reinforced. And, and the, 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 the ground gets, the foundation gets firmed up. And you're, and you're strengthened because of the truth. The truth of God's Word. That's what it means when it says it's the pillar and the ground. It's really a basis or a foundation. It's the, as the truth is supported by the church, the truth rests upon the church. Just like a house does on its foundation. Fixed, stable, and permanent, and it'll, it'll stand when the storms of life come. It'll hold you firm. It'll hold you steadfast. You won't be swept away like a house built on the sand. Don't minimize the church. Well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't. You just have to know Christ as your Savior. But you have to go to church if you're going to be a good Christian. If you're going to be a successful Christian, then the church is vital. It's one of the four sources of truth that you have to have in your life. Satan Satan hates to face a Christian that has their loins girt about with truth. Now, I don't want to embarrass you. Don't raise your hand. But I think most of us will relate to this. Because probably if, you're, if, you're, if everybody was honest in here, there's a time in your life when you've told a lie. And there's also a time in your life when after you told that lie, it eventually came out. And the truth came out and you were confronted. And you had to admit you lied. Remember how you feel? You feel rotten. You feel devastated. You feel sick. If you don't, something's wrong with you. Maybe you're not a Christian. But you just feel devastated about it. Do you understand? That's how you'll make Satan feel when you confront his lie with the truth. The truth of the Son of God, the truth of the Word of God, the truth of the Spirit of God and the truth of the church of God. It devastates him. And it defeats him. It exposes his lies and deceptions for what they are. And you know what? It breaks his power over you. Prayerfully, every day, gird your loins with truth. You have to use it to fight the deceptions and the lies of Satan. And then ask God to help you always speak the truth and live the truth. That God's Word will be a delight to you. Boy, fill up on it every day. You know why? You're filling yourself with truth. You're, you're putting on, you're girding your inside with truth. And you've got to have that. Now next week, we'll talk about the breastplate of righteousness. All right?
Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Oh, before you stand, don't, don't, don't stand yet. Um, great to have Brother Jimenez and his family here. And uh, remember, uh, how many of you here Sunday night when Brother Hector preached? Uh, he's bearing precious seed out of El Paso and been doing it for 17 years. And this man, Monday night, Tuesday night, twice on Wednesday, and, uh, and again on Thursday, he'll, he'll preach in Mexico. And I, I know the weeks we've been there, it's been 200 and 300 saved and the times we've gone, and that happens week after week through the summer. And that's happened that way for 17 years. Uh, been amazingly used of God to preach the gospel and to see souls come to Christ. And um, I wasn't aware until I talked to him afterwards. You know, he's, he's here for the missions conference at Milford, but he's also... Uh, trying to raise some more individual support for himself. And I think that would be a great investment for us, that we, we take him on and be a supporting church of Brother Jimenez. And uh, so all those in favor of taking him on as one of our missionaries, let it be known by hearty eye Aye. and opposed by like sign. Amen. Wanted to do that while you're here, Brother Hector, all right? And uh, appreciate you so much and your family. And uh, it's just a blessing to, to be able to partner with you. And uh, excited about what God, God has done and what he's going to do uh, with you there in Mexico. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand together now for prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you now for this evening. Thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for this armor that you give to us to put on. And Lord, we just take it piece by piece. And, and tonight we focus on putting on our loins girt about with truth. That we put on that belt of truthfulness. And Lord, we pray that we'll remind ourselves and be conscious to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would uh, di rightly divide the word of truth, that we would understand your word is truth. That we would understand that we have the spirit of truth that dwells in us and empowers us and helps us. And we are part of the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. So help us to speak the truth against the lies and deceptions that Satan brings our way. And help us to recognize the deceptions and the errors he would lead us into. And Lord, give us the victory through your truth. We love you tonight. Thank you for your word that you've given to us. Now, Lord, dismiss us with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. Help us to help your light to shine through us that others will see Christ in our lives this week. And we'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing Higher Ground. Remember to be praying for the Moreland family. They're in Chicago area in a missions conference. And uh, Brother Yoder and his wife are up in Canton uh, at a missions conference. And so they'll be there Wednesday through Sunday. And so please pray that all will go well with those conferences. And uh, uh, Old Fashioned Sunday this Sunday. And then... Uh, ladies, don't forget, you can look out there for the hats. Sign up for the dinner if you haven't done that yet. And uh, ladies on the retreat, don't forget your times if you're going to be riding the bus. All right, let's sing together, shall we? I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. God bless you. You are dismissed.